Hi, and welcome to the Nanabas Audits and Investigations. And we are here for another episode of the Scientology Chronicles. And today we are going to talk about the life that was taken was a Scientologist by the name of William Fisk. And we are going to jump right on in. On September 13, 1963, redacted Seattle, Washington Police Department advised that on September 11th, 1963, William J. Fisk of Seattle, head of a religious mystical church, was shot to death before members of his group in the Seattle headquarters in the Church of Scientology of Washington State. Redacted in Seattle, surrendered to the Seattle Police Department. He was charged with the premeditated killing and his apparent motive was his belief that his wife's estrangement from him resulted from the instructions given to this group by Fisk. Literature and correspondence in possession of the deceased obtained by the Seattle Police Department indicated that this group was affiliated with the founding Church of Scientology, a.k.a. Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard, founder, Hubbard Association of Scientologists International, whose headquarters in the United States are in Phoenix, Arizona. Among the possessions... Among the possessions of the deceased was the enclosed pamphlet entitled Brainwashing, a synthesis of the Russian textbook on phycopolitics, a copy of which is enclosed for the Bureau's information. Redacted advised that it was apparent from prepared lectures of the deceased that this pamphlet was used in instructing his group. Seattle District called and said that Reverend William J. Fisk had been shot and killed on the evening of September 10th, 1962. A Russell E. Johnson had been arrested for this murder, and the Seattle papers reported that Reverend Fisk had been deliberately shot before four witnesses. Seattle will submit more complete reporting, and the purpose of this call was to report the request of the Seattle police police captain that was planning to, to conduct a raid of the church properties at 1112 Fourth Avenue on the morning of September 12, 1963. The police captain had contacted the district and requested or asked if their inspector would care to accompany them. The district was calling for permission to comply with this request. Inspector Ed Floyd of Seattle District has had some prior conversations with Mr. Johnson. These occurred on August 27th and September 5th, and it was understood during these meetings Mr. Johnson would provide to the inspector some information about the operation of this Scientology group. Mr. Johnson had advised Inspector Floyd that there were approximately 15 e-meters at the 4th Avenue address, and he had obtained some of the literature used by the church. On September 9th, he indicated to Inspector Floyd that inasmuch as his wife was now proposing to take their small children to this church, he would go ahead with the divorce. Mr. Morton advised that approximately two weeks ago, he had learned that Polly Hubbard, second wife of Ron Hubbard, was experiencing a reoccurrence of her cancer, and Mr. Morton suggested that if depositions were being contemplated, that they be obtained in the very near future. He understood that her name was Ox and was living at Gap, Pennsylvania. On 
September 12th, 1963, I received a phone call from Captain D.R. Phillips of the Seattle Police Department. He stated that he was on the homicide detail investigating the homicide of William J. Fisk, which occurred September 10th, 1963, on the premises of the Church of Scientology of Washington State. He said it was his understanding that our department had taken some action against e-meter devices in Washington, D.C. He asked if we had a file on them here and if we could furnish any information regarding them or the above-named organization. I told him that we did have a limited file and that I would consult with the district director and determine what information could be given. Inspector Ed Floyd and I then visited Captain Phillips at his office. He obtained the attached written request for information. We gave Captain Phillips a verbal resume of our contacts with redacted, which have been reported to the administration. We told him that we have a case pending on a seizure of e-meters in Washington, D.C., the person in charge of the premises at this time was Dorothy Ann Brodded, who identified herself as acting secretary of the local group. She stated to Captain Phillips that she had been secretary of the local group until early this year when she had gone to the Los Angeles branch. She said she had returned here by plane following the murder and had been authorized by the national organization to assume charge of the office. Captain Phillips instituted a search of the office files, whereupon Ms. Brodded ob objected and called an attorney. Upon the advice of an attorney, she made strenuous objection to a search of the files pertaining to the individual members although Captain Phillips had been previously advised by the prosecutor's office that he was at liberty to examine such files. He did avoid examination of personal files at this time. In one room of the premises, there were four e-meters arranged on small serving trays. Some had metal cans attached to the electrodes, photographs of the devices, and the room are submitted. Chalk marks chalk marks on the floor indicated where Reverend Fisk had been slain. There was another e-meter in an adjoining room. In one corner of the room, there was a small platform on which there were papers and files and two or three similar devices. Miss Brodded told Captain Phillips that these particular devices had been made locally. She stated to Captain Phillips that she, Reverend Fisk, and his wife, Donna Fisk, had brought the other devices with them personally from England at various times. On a table in the file room, there was a pile of papers, which included instructions for conducting tests, lists of questions, and grading forms. Listing the following personnel, President William J. Fisk, Secretary Reverend Richard G. Walker, Treasurer Donna Fisk, Staff Members Phoebe Ann Helm, Kurt Charles, Ronald H. Arnold, William E. Lawrence, Irene Durbin. The police had confirmed that the organization was incorporated November 30th of 1956 as a nonprofit corporation under the name Founding Church of Washington. Also included was a letter from the same office postmarked January 25th, 1963, addressed to Dorothy Brodded. Acknowledging her letter of January 21st, 1963, and referring to her receipt of meters and advising her that they would reimburse her for customs dues in the amount of $14.95. This was signed Edgar. A photocopy is submitted. Other information indicates that this was signed by Edgar Watson. 
Technical Materials Secretary. Attached are photocopies of various form letters, which were extracted from the files. These bear the letterhead of the Hubbard Communications Office, East Grinstead, Sussex, and are identified variously as policy letters, administrative letters, and newsletters. Although none of these bore actual signatures, they contain considerable information about the organization of the cult, its purposes and operational procedures, methods of financing, and use of the e-meters for both mental and physical healing purposes. There was one bulky file on FDA, which contained copies of letters from various members of the organizations to numerous congressmen and senators and replies received. The file contained copies of letters of Mr. Harvey and Mr. Goldhammer, which had been written in response to inquiries from congressional members. Among the HCO newsletters was one in 1962 announcing that Mary Sue Hubbard would be deputy executive director while Ron Hubbard was in Washington, D.C. Here we are again, another family destroyed by Scientology. His wife had gotten involved in Scientology and the group told him to divorce, told her and the group told her to divorce her husband. And probably because in some of these past documents that we've already covered, they, if the, if the spouse isn't on board, they do instruct you to get divorced. And here this poor man was probably completely distraught and probably couldn't take it and took the law into his own hands guarantee you he was probably somebody who tried to sound the alarm, sound the code red, and got nowhere and took the law into his own hands and took the life of a Scientologist. What do you guys think in the comments about this story? Some of these stories seem to be very repetitive. Same circumstances, just different people, right? Same game, just different players. Tell me in the comments what you think about the story. And um, let me know if you've heard anything about this, this story. If you Did you hear it? Have you ever heard anything about um, William J. Fisk and his loss of life? Let me know in the comments. Thank you. Uh, no more kids in Scientology. Kids can't consent. And don't forget to spread love and kindness wherever you go. And I'll catch you on the next one.